Um, I have li very little time. The topic clearly is very big, but I will try to give you a crash course, pretty much in psychology right now, um, and at least convey to you the methodology that we've been using for the last 14 months with quite a bit of success. Um, as you know, you have met amazing people here. You, uh, you have learned amazing classes. Um, many of you probably had had some insights and aha moments. You will go outside into the world that maybe is not as friendly as everybody here. Uh, people will say you have crazy ideas that might not work out. So I want to give you a couple of tools to actually deal with that. Because ultimately what we believe is that success, any kind of success, you know, business success, sports success, Movement success starts here, six inches between the ears, in our minds. And so very quickly, and I have the time here, um, very quickly who I am, because you know, people like to know who's standing in front of them, talking a little bit down on them. Um, what is mind hacking? What do we understand by that? And finally, uh, how can we hack and upgrade ourselves? Um, a little bit about myself, I am a scientist who spent more than 10 years doing academic research at various institutions um, in US, Europe, research in Israel, um, turned entrepreneur who has created and sold companies, some of them still going on, some of them, some of them went nowhere, um, typical entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial life. And finally, a mind hacker, we, um, and I will explain that, top, that theme to you, uh, we have worked with a lot of companies, a lot of people, um, with quite a bit of success, and so, literally, very briefly, what is Self Hackathon? Um, Self Hackathon was born out of the idea that there are places, if you want to go and learn how to program, uh, you can go to Coursera, you can go to Code Academy, and there are places to go and learn. However, there's no place to learn something that's much more important than learning how to code, is to, it's to how to code yourself. Um, and, and that's kind of the place where we all come together. So I represent 20 other scientists from all over the world um, and experts, and what we try to do is we try to bridge science, scientific research, and really um, high-performing individuals such as yourself. And so what is mind hacking? Um, we believe that just like we all hackers, we all try to both hack each other and hack ourselves. Um, in psychology, we say everybody is an intuitive psychologist. Um, it's a natural human need to try to understand others and understand ourselves. It just very often we don't have the right tools to do it. And so in mind hacking, we actually inspect the code first. Um, then we rewire and then we upgrade. So let me just show it to you how it works. First of all, the framework. And the framework is that the human mind, those seven inches, 20 centimeters between your ears is the most untapped um, and at the same scarce resource in, in this planet. We talk about, uh, especially at this conference, we talk about gold, we talk about oil, we talk about um, you know, all those natural resources that are running out. Really, the most precious one is here. Um, you have 100 billion neurons and 100 trillion connections between those neurons, and the ability of those neurons to create and co-create is endless. And so I invite you to actually um, respect the mind because it's extremely powerful. This is the tool that actually created ISIS, and this is the tool that also um, developed cure to cancer and will develop cure to cancer. And so um, this space combined with other space is extremely powerful. The second framework, and that's really my favorite one, and this, um, this is and a half for a lot of people, is that we are living code. Um, in reality, your brain and your nervous system constantly wires and rewires itself, even right now. Um, we know from neuroscience that there are new neurological connections being born, uh, new neurons being born, and the brain constantly rewires itself. So every single time you have an aha moment or a great conversation with somebody, what happens is, First of all, the brains start to sync up. Literally, the brain waves start to sync up, and heart rates also start to sync up. And then the nervous system syncs up with the nervous system of another person. And so we talk about wetware. Um, I like to use the technological language simply because um, this is what a lot of people understand. If I start talking about parts of the brain and parts of the nervous system, nobody really cares. Whereas when we talk about um, hacking, upgrading, uh, it, it's a language that a lot of people understand. And so. Today I will talk about three things, hardware, software, and wetware. And hardware is your body, clearly, because that's what we kind of get. We can't really, not yet until singularity comes, you have to live in this body. So it's the hardware. Then there's the software, which is our thoughts, our beliefs, our values. And then there's that space in between, and that's the wetware. Um, if any of you have seen a human brain, it's wet, it's gray, it's mushy, and um, and that's really beautiful about it because it's very malleable, right? When you have a plastiline or you have any kind of malleable thing, it, it has to be wet. 
in order to, to ship. And so this is our brain. So your brain is a wetware. Um, and finally, the last uh, piece of the framework I want to give to you is that pretty much every skill in life is hackable and learnable. Um, the brain is malleable, therefore we are able, given the right circumstance and given the right pieces uh, of the puzzle, we, learn, we are able to learn um, and hack pretty much anything. And so um, today I will talk about three parts, and this is really the very, very basic intro into mind hacking. We're going to talk about three parts because we get coded through different parts. The first part is the head, then it's the heart, and then it's the body. And so, are you guys ready? Yeah. Okay, uh, give somebody a high five. Somebody you don't know, okay? <laughs> and uh, tell them if you were to hack one thing in your life, an upgrade, one thing in your life, right now, after those three days of the conference, what would it be? What would you want to change in your life as you exit, you know, tonight, um, the door of this or this place? What one change would you do in your life? You don't have to say that to me. Say it to some partner. What could that be? Okay, you guys are going to take my time, so. Um, so it really starts with awareness, honestly. Um, keep that in mind as I go through the points, because this is really, those are the tools I'm giving to you. Um, and those tools are not mine. They've been around for hundreds of years. Um, they've been locked into kind of the academic papers, and all we try to do is bring them back to you and give it to you in a form that's actually understandable and uh, easy to apply. So first of all, we're going to start with the head. The head is the source of um, thoughts, beliefs, um, biases that we have. Uh, we talk about psychological OS. It's kind of like when you have a phone, it comes with a pre-installed how it works. So this is really um, the thoughts and beliefs that we have. Research shows that 40% of all our actions every single day are automatic. In other words, half of the day we run an autopilot. The second piece of research shows that we have more or less 70,000 thoughts a day. Um, research shows actually uh, men have 60,000, women have 80,000. It uh, evens out to being 70,000. There's actually a reason why women tend to think more. Uh, we can go into that over drinks. Um, <laughs> Out of that 70,000 thoughts a day, up to 90% are the same. It depends for people, but we tend to think the same thoughts, right? Once the neurological pathway is developed, we, keep, we think, oh, okay, it sucks, it rains again, I have to go to work, I really don't want to go to work tonight, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so think about the thoughts that you think. And finally, most of the apps, if, if you wish, come pre-installed. So when you buy a new iPhone, there are certain apps, kind of what she mentioned, that are pre-installed, and you can't really delete them. All you can do is download new apps. So the apps that we see as pre-installed are the apps that come from our childhood. How we got programming, this is culture, this is religion, this is what we learn in the house, this is the gender roles, this is what women do, this is what men do, uh, this is what it means to be Polish, and this is what it means to be French. Um, those apps come pre-installed, but then there are a whole bunch of apps that you can actually install. And the apps that we see as psychologists that are really worth installing are three major, three major categories. The first one is actually confidence. Um, how we see confidence is a power to, as opposed to power over. A lot of people think, oh, she's so confident, which means arrogance. No, we see confidence as, as a power to say, power to do, power to be who you, who you really are. Um, and self-esteem. Self-esteem is kind of like my pet project. I spent many years researching uh, self-esteem because self-esteem is a psychological immune system. Just as your body has an immune system, so does your mind have an immune system, right? So it functions in a very similar way. It's more ephemeral, um, but it's an extremely important thing to have. The second is self-compassion. It's a, it's, it's a, somebody said self-compassion is a bubble bath for your mind. And it really it is. Um, you can see a lot of people being extremely compassionate towards others and feeling all the pains of the world except for their, for their own pain. 
And uh, I see that a lot in Silicon Valley. I work a lot with Silicon Valley entrepreneurs and the pressure to perform means there's no room for self-compassion. There's no room for failure. Um, and it has to do with two big ones, which is growth mindset and resilience. And finally, self-awareness. And this is really where the Eastern traditions come in and where you really start observing yourself. Um, so my background is in experimental social psychology, which means I observe people, um, including here and now. Um, I invite each one of you to actually start observing yourself and become the scientist that we all naturally are, um, with no judgment. Because really, the thing is, we, the little creature inside of us is so shy that we really have to observe it as an anthropologist. And so tonight, as you walk around, observe yourself and observe other people and how you interact with those people. Now the heart. What's in your heart? Blood. blood. Okay, besides the blood. What else is in the heart? Emotions. Now that's, I don't know how many of you can actually see this picture. Um, for some people, emotions are, is this land of peace and people just move swiftly from one to another and it makes perfect sense. For many of us, it looks like this. It's children in the fog. We don't understand our own emotions. There are certain places we don't even want to go to. Um, my research, our research was, uh, we studied morality, but we started the dark side of the human nature. So I study all the emotions that people really don't want to feel. Shame, guilt, humiliation, jealousy, fear, anxiety. Um, this, is, this, is, this was really the, the place where I, I like to swim in. Um, and those are emotions that are extremely important, and at the same time, none of us wants to feel it. And so think of emotions as your emotional OS. In other words, before the thoughts even come, we react with emotions. Re emotions are actually um, very rapid decision-making mechanisms. And that's what gets us into trouble, but that's also what makes us fall in love with somebody, right? We get that feeling for a person. Um, I can go on and on about emotions, but just to um, quote somebody else that's much, much wiser than, than I am, this is, um, and I'm almost out of time, um, this is actually probably one of the biggest wisdoms when it comes to emotions and, and the language of the human heart. Um, this comes from Viktor Frankl, who was a Holocaust survivor, a psychiatrist who was actually in Auschwitz. And he observed all the people, and clearly um, his family was totally destroyed, um, but he observed one thing. He observed that certain people actually survived. And, um, and he, being a medical doctor and being a psychiatrist, he, he wrote a book about it, but he said one thing that, um, that I like a lot, and he says between stimulus and response, there is a space, right? There is a stimulus, and then we react to that stimulus. And there is a space, and that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom, right? So in that little gap that exists before what I say and how you react, there is this tiny, tiny millisecond gap. The whole, spe the, really the whole work we do is we try to make that gap maybe two milliseconds so that you actually have a chance to react, have a chance to take a breath and decide, is that reaction going to make sense or will it be very emotional? And then finally, and I know I'm out of time, um, let me tell you about the body because this is really what's going to come about tonight. Um, it turns out we are actually, um, you know, you have... This really communicates much more than anything else. Uh, when you look at the research, we first look at the body language, then we look at um, the voice that people say, and I could go into voice because there's so much to talk about the voice and how we convey ourselves with our voice. Then we look at the face, the facial expression. Only finally we look at what people say. And so really body is the fastest tool to hack the mind. And, uh, if any of you have seen Amy Cuddy's talk about power poses, um, I highly, highly recommend you see it. But let me just tell you, play around with the body language tonight. Because as you will see, people re will react to you very, very differently. How you talk, how you, how you, how you stand, how you talk, even how you walk. Um, that's the ultimate mind hacking tool because it's really the fastest. You, we go around all the um, defense mechanisms. And then one last thing, if I may, there's a fourth part how we get hacked, and this is really the, f the strongest one. This is other people. And um, who you surround yourself with, we are social beings, and uh, we literally hardwired to be social. And there's all a bunch of research from neuroscience, psychology, showing how, how social we are. And so what, in the fastest way to hack oneself is actually surround yourself with the people how you want to be. And so um, 
this is really today was is the experiment for you to to um, choose the tribe that you want to be in. And this is amazing because technology and events like this allow us to you know get the say get the tribe together. So I invite you to really. Um, run with that because this is really the way to hack our how we can hack ourselves the fastest um, i'm out of time i'm happy to talk more because clearly this is um this is haven't even scratched the surface um, but um think of yourself as as a living code that literally gets hacked wired and wired constantly um, because that actually that message gives us a lot of power into our own hands um, and it's been an honor pleasure thank you for for having me here in here.